I welcome you all to today's webinar on Brand Bharat. We are very lucky to have two eminent scholars, writers, uh, Sri D.K. Hari and Srimati D.K. Hima Hari with us. Uh, it's it's uh, been uh, great to have them here because they have done so much of research and so much of writing and they have been speaking on various issues concerning Bharat, our culture, our beliefs, our history. And uh, it was really, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful to uh, both of them for having accepted uh, my request to come to India Policy Foundation's webinar and address us. Uh, I would request our uh, senior research associate, uh, Srimati Lakshmi Parmeshwaran, to kindly introduce uh, both the speakers. Lakshmi, over to you, please. Yes. Good evening, everyone. It's indeed a pleasure to introduce the power couple who have committed their lives to the pursuit of knowledge. Dr. D.K. Hari and Dr. Kehima Hari, as we are all well aware, are the founders of Bharat Gyan, a civilizational study initiative to compile and present the knowledge of India and its ethos from an Indian perspective. An interesting fact is that they're management and IT professionals. Dr. D.K. Hari hails from a traditional Indian family with its roots in Kanchipuram. He did his schooling in Andhra Pradesh and graduated in commerce from Madras Christian College, Chennai. He completed his post-graduation in business administration from PSC College of Technology, Coimbatore. He has over 20 years of industry experience in marketing, brand building and supply chain through family-owned businesses in petroleum and FMCG verticals as well as from the building material industry. Dr. D.K. Hemahari is an IT professional turned researcher in civilizational studies. She was born in Mysore and grew up and was educated in Mumbai, got married and has settled down to live in Chennai with her husband and a joint family. She graduated in physics and later did her post-graduation in computer technology as a topper from Bombay University. She is a PMI certified project management professional with over 20 years of experience in the IT industry with the first 10 years at TCS and next 10 years at CSE India, focusing mainly on managing innovation and nurturing new technologies for multinationals worldwide. Both Dr. D.K. Hari and Dr. Hema Hari have traveled extensively to over 30 countries to understand those civilizations, their culture and knowledge. It was this exposure that motivated them to leave their lucrative professional careers and establish Bharat Gyan as an endeavor to fill the void in the showcasing of the knowledge, practices and culture of the Indian civilization across the millennia. The USP is a range and depth of data that they present on the Indian civilization from the perspective of India and Indian ethos. They are also widely sought after as speakers on the Indian civilization across India and the globe. They've given over 250 joint talks in India and abroad on diverse subjects. They've authored 27 books and produced five documentaries as well as many short films. They've published a monumental series called the Autobiography of India, comprising many multi-volume titles of which two titles spanning across nine volumes have already been released. The first one is Brand Bharat and the other is Breaking the Myths. Brand Bharat is a five-volume series. The titles include Made in India, Roots in India, Unique to India, Leads from India, and Future from India. They are also the recipients of several awards, including the Sri B.R. Haran Memorial Award and the Vishalakshi Award. Thank you, Dr. Hari and Dr. Hema Hari, for finding the time to address today's webinar. We look forward to an insightful and interesting discussion. Over to you, sir. So, sir, over to you. Uh, now you can start. And, uh, after that, uh, after your presentation yeah. and your speech, we will have a question answer session. And I would request our uh, eminent participants. We have uh, retired bureaucrats uh, like uh, former tourism secretary yeah. Lalit Kumar sir, many professors Santosh Sukla ji, uh, Ayushri Ketkar ji, Jagdish Singh ji, uh, journalist, columnist, uh, scholars, people are uh, retired income tax officials. So I welcome you all. And uh, we, we look forward to very enlightening and uh, value addition uh, in terms of, you can say, enhancing our knowledge by listening to D.K. Hariji. Sir, over to you. Uh, please. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Kundi Ji, for uh, inviting us to speak at India Policy Foundation. Thank you so much. And also, I'd like to thank uh, 
Ms. Lakshmi Parmesan for uh, introducing us so well. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, getting on the subject of brand Bharat. So, in, it's, the term itself is quite interesting. <clears throat> we all know land as Bharat. But this land Bharat itself is a brand by itself. As uh, Ms. Lakshmi introduced us, what we have been doing in Bharat Gya is to collate information on our civilization. We have been doing it for 25 plus years, both my wife and myself, and bring it out in a format, in a method that we can relate to in today's generation. The methods that is easy to, for youngsters to assimilate and use it thereon is what we try to bring in, so that it's easy. Otherwise, it's all in some lofty books for people to know whether they wouldn't even sort of step in or log in. So that's what we've done. We'll show you some samples from there. We'll take it forward. We'll, we'll just share screen with you now. Sure, sir. So the idea is Bharat is a brand by itself. If so, for what is a question we should need to ask ourselves. In our land, we say India, that is Bharat. Just two names. The first question that comes to our mind is how did these two names come about? India and Bharat. To the northwest of India, we have the Sindhu Nadi, which is how we say it in our national anthem and all else, which the Persians and Arabs, when they came eastwards, not 1500 years back or 2000 years back, but 4500, 5000 years back, in their language then, Sir and Her were interchangeable. So for them, Sindh became Hind for them. Very much the way we have. Now in Hindi, Sari Sadi, Bangal Bangal, Shukla Shukra, Rala Beda, Verba Beda, Rada, like that. Then we had Saha. So Sindhu became, for the Persians and Arabs, Hind then. In their language, this is about 4,500, 5,000 years ago. And for them, the land around the Sindhu Nadi and beyond the Sindhu Nadi became Hind. That's how they call it. So it is a name given to us by our neighbors in their tongue. We'll also see a little later how this name morphed and came back as India. We'll see a little later. If you look at the name Bharat, of course, we have a lot of kings by the name Bharat, the illustrious lineage of kings, many, many of them. But for all of them, what is the root? Ba obviously means Bhaskara, Banumati, Ba here meaning denoting light, knowledge, and Ratha, Rati, delight, Ratha, connoisseur of, Ratha, immersed in. So Bharata is a land which the people who are Bharatiya are ones who are immersed in knowledge. Who are involved in knowledge. So people seeking knowledge, people relishing knowledge, people discussing knowledge are the people who are Bharata, Bharatiya and Ma Bharati. Now, can we think of any other civilization in the world? There have been many civilizations in the world. Any of them calling themselves as a land of knowledge. You have land to the east of India, north of India, south, west, everywhere. Just pause for a moment. Think of any of those names. They have different names by different countries. You have an England, which comes from an island called Inglis. You have Germany, you have uh, France, you have uh, uh, Europe or uh, America or China. All of them, none of them call themselves land of knowledge. We have identified ourselves as a land of knowledge. We have branded ourselves as a land of knowledge. Look at the beauty of it. Now, we'll see little as we call us to who else brand. So we can call ourselves as land of knowledge. People to the west of us, the civilization called us as a geographical term in their tongue, as Hind. Let's see who else called ourselves as a land of knowledge as we go along. If you look at the Chinese, there is a proverb, ancient proverb in China. They looked at the world from five perspectives. The Chinese itself, they called them the, the king as king of humans because people obeyed authority and government policy. 
and the Turks they called them as ferocious because they were courageous and ferocious. Farsi, so Persia has an American name, Farsi. It's a fertile land with nice rivers, Euphrates, Firat, and Tigris. So they call themselves center of the world with wealth and glory. Rome, Roma's handsome physical men. So Roma. And what did they call Indians, the Chinese? King of wisdom, where knowledge and sciences were cultivated. Look at the beauty of it. Was it not we calling ourselves Bharata, a civilization to the northeast of us, which has to come through the west or again through the southeast China seas, even though we are divided only by hills and one land in between? They called us land of king of knowledge. This is what two millennia ago, three millennia ago. So look at this. So we calling ourselves is one thing, we branding ourselves is one thing. Another civilization with whom we have a continuous studies across millennia, also branding you the same as king of wisdom. Look at the beauty, how well we have been branded by ourselves and our neighbors. That's the beauty of it here. Now, so we are truly Bharata and Bharati. So that's what we showed in one slide here. This is there in a book, Brand Bharat. This word Bharat, one we have branded ourselves based on knowledge. We also have chosen to call ourselves Bharat, if you see, from the meaning of the word Bharat. One is to relish knowledge. Bharat also denotes, see, one beautiful thing about our land, because we are relishers of knowledge, we have realized that this knowledge is of so many levels, at a very plain physical level, at a very subtle level and so on. <coughs> so, at a physical level, if you see, the activities that we were engaged in also gave us the name Bharat. The word Bha means glow, we have seen, because it means Bhaskara, Bhanumati, the sun, the glow, the rays of the sun, light. Now, what is another activity which gives, which needs a lot of light, fire, glow? Metallurgy. And this metallurgy has been an activity of this civilization for more than 5,000 years. And all of these, the evidence of these lies in our Indus Valley civilization, what is called the Indus Valley, but is the Sindhu Saraswati civilization. And also all across, see people when, when they study about India in Western countries today, they only think of India means Indus Valley civilization. But if you really look at it, the footprint of this metallurgy and lot of all such activities, you will find it all across India, pan India. And these kind of metallurgical activities, which needed lot of bha, the bhartan, the word for alloyed vessels and zinc especially, zinc alloyed vessels in which we were excelling, bharat, bharat, that is how you get bhartan in Marathi in uh, various languages, uh, you. you will say uh, Bharatan for vessels. So Bharat, Bharat is also a land of metallurgy where people excelled in metallurgy and there is so much of data to show how the Bronze Age of this world has been fueled by this civilization. So when we speak about historical periods, Stone Age, Ice Age, Iron Age, Bronze Age, these are ages we speak about. We think they are very European. But do you realize for a moment, the moment the world says Bronze Age, alloying is with us. It's not there anywhere else. We'll explain it as we go along. We'll see all those so, products. There could have been no Bronze Age in the world itself without India providing the technology and the produce of bronze. So if you see Bronze Age in the world, it has got a huge brand of Bharat. We'll see the proofs as we go along. Also, so now literally if you look at it from a gross physical uh, geographical aspect also, Bharat as it stands, it means that which is enjoying Bha, light of the sun. Look at this. This land is exactly in this, very close to the equator. It's in the tropics. So by nature of its location, it enjoys the light. Now you would say there are so many other lands in this tropical zone. So what is so special about our land? 
here the beauty of this lies in the fact that it gets these seasonal annual monsoons and beautifully we get these monsoons after peak summer now imagine so which means that the summer is gone you get your rains and then subsequently the weather is good enough for you to continue and produce the agricultural output and all produce <clears throat> suppose you get the rains before summer the rains come and then the summer comes what will happen you cannot produce you cannot grow so your summer is over then your rains come so the land has been blessed with sunshine and with rain in the sequence it needs to be not in the contra sequence it's not so elsewhere the sequencing is very important which is what so topographically also we are right so we have the light immersed in land of sunshine but if you look at the other big landmass see here you know you have a lot of desert desert you you, you may have sunlight but you you cannot use it because it's not productive so we are uniquely geographically placed there we'll see go as we go along that is why if you see etymologically we have seen why we are bharat in literature we have got many kings who are bharat they who relish knowledge Bharat, we have, that we have seen in history too. So literally, how we call ourselves? <laughs> Metallurgically, we have seen our name Bharat suits us for climate, the latitude, wherever we are. The word Bharat suits from many, many multiple angles. The people are seekers of knowledge. So this brand name Bharat for us is just at in whichever direction you look at it. From all aspects, it seems to fit. This land, and there are all these reasons, old, good, and true at the same time. So we are not named yeah. after a quirk of history. We are not named after because somebody came to our our land first by ship. Look at this. For example, the term America comes because there was a person by name Amerigo who went to that land by ship. It's just because Vasco da Gama came, we are not calling our land Vasco. The way it is America. So we and our way we have branded ourselves, look at it from multiple perspectives, etymology, literature, history, metallurgy, climate, people. So it's a multi-layered name and holds good at each layer. That's the beauty of it. Because, That's a naturally endowed name. Because if you go through literature, you will find that in the Veda, there is mention of this land as and the people as Bharatam Janam. Vishwamitra tells that we are Bharatam Janam. We are so the of the land of Bharat, people who are citizens of the land of Bharat. So it is a short film we have made on this, you can please watch it later. And look at this. How did we call us? We called ourselves Bharat. But look at how the naming for India happened by different civilizations. Hind, in the So we saw how the Persians refer to us as Hind. Now, the Persians and the Greek, they have had a lot of contact. So, when this goes further to the Europe, the H gets dropped. It becomes silent and therefore it becomes Ind. Ind, Inde, Indi. So, the H is dropped. So, the Ind, I-N-D retains and this retained in many forms. Finally, it goes to the uh, English, English uh, islands. islands. And from there, it becomes India and that's how we started calling ourselves India. But the word Indi, Indi is there in European literature and their references from a very, very long time. So in, this is not a new name because that is how they have known us for a long time. And in fact, even in uh, if you go to the East, uh, words in uh, Chinese like Tianshu, Shendu, all these are morphed forms of the word Hind, Sindh, the Sindhu river has played a major role in defining because anytime all these people typically came this way and it was the land across the Sindhu. You know, if you say brand Bharat, we get this, how to get the branding, not just by name, not just by knowledge, but actually by doing something. So what did we do? You see, we did something called big five. There's a big five. But for this, interestingly, we'll just show you something in contrast. Keep this word big five in mind. If you go to Africa and speak about big five, what will they speak about? The game. 
the animal game so there are these five animals which are considered as the big five so people are called for tourism in africa for these big five but in bharat we have had another set of big five and that is what we are going to see because this is what defined our brand for us as well look at the big five first is iron and steel zinc cotton indigo sugar and spice these are the big five literally because iron and steel is something as we had said some time back what we gave to the world across millennia see the the greek they called it as on the neek the technique of making indian silk is called on the neek and hundwani was indian silk hind hundwani and all of them speak about it in glowing terms the steel was what we gave to the world and what do you do with the steel we'll come to that moment look at this the product was oops steel the word oops is obviously an anglican word because the english tongue and english oral cavity could not pronounce it the way it was pronounced in india for example in the tamil language it's called uruk meaning to smelt and in kannada telugu and all marathi all of it is called ukku so the smelting by the process of smelting it got the word oops which is what you know it of now but this steel even the famous saladin sword of damascus which is what you read all over in the medieval history as the greatest of the swords saladin's damascus sword is what they say is made from the uruk uk oud steel of bharat not only that and what is the arabic word because the arabs were the trading in our steel and sending it to europe they were traders they bought indian made produce and sold it to europe which wanted apart from their own personal use and what did they call the steel muhanad means that which comes from hind muhanad from hind that's all that's what they mm -hmm. called it steel and look persians when chatrapati shivaji's maratha army and all other armies of india when they slash somebody's slopes or they take a war cry what do they say har har mahadev isn't it and that's how they go hmm? but look at this the persian way of slashing somebody with a sword was called jawab e hind meaning i reply to you with an indian made sword so this jawab e hind slashing somebody was jawab e hind Meaning, I cut you with an Indian made sword. Look at that. So, your branding of Bharat happens in the steel, in the oat steel. So, we just say we can't say we export oat steel. Oat steel has layers of meaning to it. That is the beauty of it. And if you look at it, this word Damascus sword itself. Damascus is a port in Syria, and uh, so if this is Syria, and so here is Syria, and this is Damascus, slightly inland today. but uh, this word for this kind of sword from india so damascus meant the wood steel from india wood steel sword damas because they had these kind of wavy wavy patterns on it on the steel blade so they were high carbon steel swords and therefore they would have these kind of wavy patterns you can find them in the salajang museum today in hyderabad yes but original swords are still there kept there and the word baby in arabian language is damas that is why today you have the brand for jewelry as the damas the arab if you go to uae the brand from dubai the brand for jewelry is the damas now they are popular even in india it's a very very famous brand to say that their designs are very watery and beautiful baby. curved curved design curvy designs but looking at the word damascus for that port This was the port where the swords from India would go and land. Initially, the swords went. Then later on, the they learned ingots. the technique of uh, making the swords. So the ingots would go there, and the swords would get made there, and uh, they would uh, be used further. So this port did it get its name? See, there are whole of uh, Syria as such is along this uh, Mediterranean Sea. So East coast of Mediterranean, and so the whole of Mediterranean. 
was supplied by Indian steel to Greece, Turkey, uh, Roman Empire, Egyptian Empire, all from Damas, which was the center of steel trade, not steel production. The production happened in India, in the Malabar coast, Konkan coast, Coromandel coast, all the, all the Indian coast, and ships were sent with this to reach the east coast of Mediterranean, where it was a hub for this particular product. Now, pause for a moment. If you say you are supplying the steel for the whole world, steel can be used only for making your utensils, making your needs of your vessels and all other needs, your plow and all that, and also for making your war implements. So what are you talking about then? India was the arms supplier of the world for five, six millennia. See, it's very interesting. We have a brand of being a nation that has never gone to war. We have not gone and conquered like many other countries. We have had done a few Southeast Asia conquests. I mean, but that is there, a few of them. And uh, uh, we have few in, far and few in history. Not We are not branded as a nation that goes out on war. But the steel that we have supplied has been used by many of these uh, countries, especially in dark ages, for a lot of war. So that is what. So steel is one of the products that we we were producing in bulk and supplying to the world in a world scale. Which is so look at the see the what is called the baby patterns. Here is Aus the Hazel, a poet who lived about thousand five hundred years ago. Look at he says how the baby pattern looks on wood steel blade. And when Alexander of Macedonia, not Alex, calling great as a different European idea, but Alexander of Macedonia came to Bharat, came to, up to the Sindhu Nadi, he did not, the defeated Alexander did not ask or take gold or silver from India. What he took was 100 talents of steel, wood steel from India as a gift. <laughs> talents is like, so like it's a Greek form of measure. And who is saying is, Catasis of Persia and Curtis are recording it in 326 BC. That is what he took from India. He didn't take gold, silver, no, he took precious metal. This was precious enough for him to take that much. So we were exporting ingots, 10,000 ingots of wood steel from here to Damas. Till it was actually they could make this quality of steel was first replicated by a person in Europe, a Swedish chemist by name Tobern. Bergman in 1774, a Swedish chemist who could make and later replicated only in 1829. That is 200 years ago only they could make steel of this scale in England. So till scale, then. Scale, not quality. It is still only scale, scale in terms of volume and industrial production volume. They could not replicate it in Europe <laughs> till, till recent. Till recent as 200 years ago, they couldn't make steel of this variety to supply to the world at large. Having said this point, what we'd like to bring out is, if we are making steel in this range and quality and this particular expanse, what does it imply? If you're making so much steel and supplying for a couple of millennia and more, what does it imply to us? I want you to pause and think for a moment. We have a short film, we'll show it to you. Just play that first 20 seconds. You can watch later watch the short film. It's there again in our YouTube channel. If it doesn't uh, play well, we you could uh, we could watch it later, but we'll introduce you to the short film to watch later if you want. Because it's a real mind bender. This is a real, real mind bender. You can mm -hmm. go back to the Bharat Gyan uh, website and Bharat Gyan YouTube channel playlist. In that, there is this playlist called Produce. I will just take you there. Yes, here is a playlist called Produce. Okay. Now, there is this film called Gold Follows Steel.
This is quote by a person by name Thomas Carlyle. He was a Scottish philosopher, historian, mathematician, teacher of the Victorian era of England. He, he makes a speech in Manchester where he makes a very clear statement. The nation which controls, gains control of iron, soon acquires control of gold. It's a very strong statement observation he makes. Because India was a manufacturer of iron and steel for the world for 2000 years and more. So all the gold was flowing into India. Those big ships that were navigating, they're actually carrying a whole lot of iron from India to the rest of the world. In a way, if you see much of the wars in Europe, which were fought between the Christendom and the Islamic world, the Arabs. So, you know, you had all the Crusades, the Dark Ages, and uh, the swords of the Arabs. For both sides, for both the armies, India supplied the steel swords. So, the famous Damascus sword and all the, all were supplied by India. So, we were the arms supplier of the world for nearly 2000 years. So you can imagine that the range of industrialization that was there in India. So country which controlled the iron, controlled the gold. After it moved from India, what happened? The country that controlled the iron went to England and Europe. So the wealth went to Europe, period of the colonization. So the shift of manufacture went from India to Europe. Then what happened? From the start of the 1900s, the shift of manufacture of iron and steel went from Europe to America. So all the gold moved towards the United States of America, the manufacture of steel, huge mega steel plants happened there. Then what happened? After World War II, Japan started manufacturing steel in a big way, importing raw material, raw ore from India. We have mentioned it in our book, Indo-Japan, how India agreed to supply, continuous supply of iron ore to Japan. So the Japanese steel industry really flourished. So Japan steel became famous. Because India's only country that agreed to supply iron ore to Japan. So all the shifting happened towards Japan. 1980s onwards, who became the steel manufacturer of the world? China. So all the gold shifted to China. Look at how the pattern moves across few centuries. This, this one statement tells you a story of how industrialization has moved, how the gold has also moved, how the economy has moved. So this is an important parameter for us. Having seen here how gold follows steel and how India was the largest steel manufacturer for centuries and millennia and also the largest repository of gold of the world. In this era of new India, we see that India is by far the largest manufacturer of iron ore and what is interesting to note here is that 50% of the iron ore that India manufactures is exported with the make in India policy that this new India has undertaken, if we can once again ensure that most of the iron ore that India brings out is utilized within India itself to make steel products both for Indian consumption as well as for export to the countries across the world, we can once again as a land attract the gold of the world and make India prosperous in multiple ways. So from India, which was a steel producer which had all the gold flowing to it and what happened it moved from india to europe so all the gold started going to europe during the colonial times then in the early 1900s america became the steel producer of the world isn't it late 1800s 1900s so all the gold started going to usa it became the superpower then what happened our post world war ii Japan, Nippon Steel became the big producer of iron and steel for the world. Where did Japan, Nippon Steel get its, because Japan by itself doesn't have raw materials, neither does it have coal, nor does it have iron ore. The coal and iron ore for Japan predominantly came from our Goa coast. And Japan Steel became famous. So we sent the ore we sent all the raw materials to Japan and they produced it and they became the steel giants of the world and all the gold went to Japan. Japan. Post 1970, <clears throat> China became the steel producer of the world. So all the gold moved to China. So post 2020, if we are once again under the make in Bharat, 
program get to produce again all the steel that the world needs, then the gold will start shifting to move back towards India after a gap of 200 years. So, the theme of the film that we are showing you, which you can all watch it later, is that it is not steel doesn't follow gold. Gold follows steel. Look at the mind change. So, if you say brand Bharat, if the brand of Bharat is steel, then gold follows steel. Actually, it's very interesting. We do not have a lot of gold mines in India. But you find that the gold reserves for millennia, we have been having a lot of gold. And gold has been held precious here. And we have valued it. We have saved it. So gold, we have today, even today, we have a lot of gold with us because of obviously our saving mentality. But where did we get all these gold? It is fundamentally because of all these trade. So it is a trade and especially with iron. And in about uh, 500 or so, Herodotus, he writes in Greece that the iron arrowhead tips for a battle in Greece in uh, 500 BCE is coming all the way from India. So the battle fought between Greece and Macedonia in a battle called Thermophile, a great battle fought in Europe, was, back, was fought with Indian iron heads. I, uh, arrow tips arrow. based on, I mean, made of iron. So, look at the brand that Bharat has been to the world. So, like this, that is how India has been a brand to the world across times. So, here we see this is there. So, when Michael Faraday, obviously, we all heard of him for having given us the concept of electricity. So, not only did we make for hard products of swords, for spears, for arrows. He wanted for fine filaments. He wanted iron, steel, metal for making his experiments. He wanted the finest or the fine ones. England, he didn't depend upon English steel, mind you. He didn't depend on British steel. He used wood steel from India for his experiments on electricity, on filaments. So, look at that. So, we were giving the hard, heavy product and the soft product. So, the finer product. So, when you say brand Bharat, it was for the refined steel in the filament form and the best of the hardest of the hard steel for fighting a battle. So, that was the range of product that we are giving. And we have all these iron pillars all over India, which all of you have aware of. So, in the face of India, also you got all this, right, from Kulluru to the Delhi pillar, Mount Abu, Tanginath, all this you have Dar, all over you have. So, like that. One of the big five that we have is the iron. So, I think we just showed you one bit of sample of iron and steel today of what, how the brand Bharat is on the subject. So, we'll just take this one. So, look at this. It's a nice story. It's actually a fictional story. This is discussion. There is some com incomplete statement we no, have seen. We, we had, no, we had go how did we get gold reserves? We didn't have gold mines. Of course, scholar gold mines is small, <laughs> not large. We had gold reserves because we are getting gold. All the gold was being funneled into India because of our exports of products. Steel, we like. cotton, because even in uh, uh, 2000 years ago, 1 CE, uh, we have uh, the Roman senator he is uh, talking Cicerio. about Cicerio, who is talking about how Rome is sending so much of million, uh, gold coins to India for the cotton that it is importing into it. Maybe another session we can show you, we'll show you the in detail about cotton. We'll show you where the film is seen. Now, I'll just finish this example. So, there is an argument between two steel swords. One is called Excalibur of King Arthur of England. The sword belongs to King Richard the Lionhearted, the famous British king. This is not an Indian steel. This is made of British iron. And you have the Damascus sword made of a brand Bharat steel, wood steel. <coughs> and the discussion is happening where in the book, The Talisman, written by Sir Walter Scott, who was not favorable to India or Indic thought. I repeat, was not favorable to India at all. If you read his works, he is not at all favorable to India. 
But even he, what he says, he compares the two swords. It is obviously uh, King Saladin and uh, the minister of Thailand never met. But it's a part of the dialogue. What do they say? Which sword is better in discussion? Because what he says is, this Excalibur, if we hit on a stone, the stone will break. That was the strength of the Excalibur, the famous British sword. And what does he say? This sword, Damascus sword, can do even better. How is it? What he says is, throw a silk sash in the air and slash it with the Damascus sword. It can cut through silk sash in thin air which offers no resistance. Because for a sword to cut through something, it must offer resistance. If a sword is so fine, it can cut through something without offering resistance. That means it's a much higher quality steel. Look at that. That's what is discussed there. So the quality of your brand Bharat is discussed in Scotland two centuries back by a person who is not favorable to India. And he speaks about the Damascus sword that's made from Indian steel as being far superior to his own sword of the Excalibur. So look at the brand, the value that it had across centuries, across seven seas. Saat samandar ke us paar. Then we'll show you one thing. So, which is why, so the when we say brand value, just with this one item itself, we would have gauged how valuable this was. Vidamas. So we saw this, right? How this has been a brand. This is very, very interesting now. So in Arabia, we have come across many women who are called Al-Hind. So their name is Hind, of course, and Al is their prefix. So we, if you ask them what is the meaning of your name, they have said that it means somebody who is precious. So who is so cherished. And the word Hind, actually, if you see, it means it is derived from the word Hind. Meaning, again, just like Muhana, it means that which is from Hind. So, in Arabia, Hind, which means brand India, has been precious for so many millennia that it, it has come to mean synonymous. So, another word for precious means Hind. And so much so that even girls have, so over a period of time, the word Hind for precious has become so... Uh, you know, together it's so synonymous that girls have just been called, precious ones have just been called Alhen. So that is the kind of brand value that India has created with the Arab world. This is much, much before even Islam uh, came into existence. So for Arabia, India was a precious uh, land, precious land. And for India too, Arabia was a very precious trading partner. So, this way, if you see the brand value of all these products have been quite high and uh, we've just seen one of them, uh, we would need time to go. Zinc is again a very beautiful story Big and story. that tells you about alloys and the Bronze Age and how Bronze, Bronze Age has been ushered into the world and uh, India's role in this uh, entire uh, fueling of the Bronze Age and which therefore gives also the value to the name Bharat for us because we called ourselves Bharat. Of course, for the world, we were in the Indi, Indi and so on. Just in one more sample, we'll look at zinc for some time. See, zinc is actually a very difficult metal to smelt. So, zinc is a uh, and, and a metal, which typically you will find it also along with lead. And uh, the metal is such that it uh, melts and then vaporizes very quickly. The window where you will find the liquid zinc is very, very short in terms of temperature window. So you have to capture it very quickly. And so if you do it very elaborately, like you allow it to boil for some time, capture the vapor and then distill it and condense it and so on, that, that process, it didn't work for many others. They were not able to get enough zinc worldwide. Now, what did our Indian mind do? 
they said oh this is the problem let's do a jugad let's turn the problem upside down so what did we do we kept the furnace on the top put the zinc ore inside these retorts made a hole here at the bottom so that when the zinc would get heated when the ore would get heated and start melting through this hole it would get captured in a retort at the base and this was kept in a cooling chamber so immediately the vapors had no other go but to come out only through the small hole they would get captured immediately in the cooling chamber and would become and you would get very good quality zinc uh, pure zinc that we were able to collect from our own so we our method was very very efficient ingenious it's all about ingenuity it's ingenuity of brand bharat in making a problem into a solution and the point is nobody else in the world could decipher this at all we were making zinc from our sindhu saraswati days industrial days all the way down if you see till 1550 that is as recently as 500 years ago it is only 1552 that the ming dynasty in china came here and learned how to make zinc and took it from here and they called it tooth nag or tota mo because all around the coromandel coast even now zinc production is called tutta nagam in the tamil telugu all languages is called tutta nagam so that's how they from here and went to make it so and in persian is called tukia and in english even it's called tati it's only in the german language it's called zinc so the what is thing zinc is actually in german english is specially called tati because that's how they took it and a person from bristol by name by name william campion he came to india with him the technology <clears throat> so he went to china took the technology from china went back to bristol in 1752 to make for the first time zinc in england in bristol and it came to be called tati there because tutanagam to totna to tati that's how the travel of zinc happened so we held the way of manufacture of zinc for well over 5 millennia and india was known for the zinc for 5 millennia and all this all this we have put up in our books to show you where the books are for it and of course obviously shown the films you can watch it later because there are about 15 in 20 films only on metals you can watch and other aspects of brand bharat but before going there you would ask you know what is so special about zinc why does somebody need zinc why did the world need zinc at all now the thing is zinc when it combines with copper you get brass similarly copper with tin gives you bronze and all of these this i the, the way you combine copper and zinc or copper and uh, 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 tin the this technique of alloy again needs a lot of fineness and uh, uh, good skills skill. metallurgical skills and that is what india had specialized so if you really look at it to show you one slide which uh, brings out this aspect of the role we have played in the bronze age so all of us talk about we talk about china what do we speak about we speak about the silk road so we world today we always everybody if they talk about civilizations they'll speak about china and they'll speak about the silk route which went from china to europe but nobody speaks about the tin route not many are even aware but there was an equal parallel tin route much older by 2 millennia and this went from hanoi here in southeast asia all the way to haifa in israel and the route was through india so this is how it would go it would go from here there were many ways in which it would come into india either through the mountains in the northeast or through the seas it would come here then go over the ganga go to yamuna it would even come down this way to the sindhu sindhu and then here likewise from here it reached south in uh, the east coast they would come here and then from here again they would reach go through all the gulf here 
so this was the so in india what was happening because tin for the world even 50% of world tin resources today are in southeast asia so this tin would come here india played the role of supplying the copper you find lot of mines of copper Kim here Kim. in rajasthan so zinc mines are also in rajasthan Zam. so the copper would get fused the alloys were made here the alloying technique was perfected here and from here the alloys were reaching rest of the world so that is how india has played it was a, literally it was in the center it was in the heart of uh, the uh, alloying technology both in terms of producing and shipping the alloys as well as uh, giving the skills for uh, alloy so uh, we have thus been very very key in this and uh, uh, you wanted to show so so that if you can this when when china says it had a silk route First of all, silk is a product that went to India as this well as well, not only from China. Because we have examples, samples of silk, a millennia before China. In our Mohandajaro, Chandu Daro, all the sites we have silk filaments. So it's a myth actually that silk originated in China alone. It was there in India, and we had our own local. So the samples show that it was a local variety of silk. So it's not the Chinese silk which was found in our Sindhu Saraswati. Uh, uh, cities. The, the very silkworm was very different. Biologically, very different silkworm we had. So, we had our own silk, which is there. We have written a full chapter on this in our book, Breaking the Myths. So, you can please check that out. It's a full chapter about that. The other point that you can see is you had a route of supplying metallurgy, which is <laughs> more important than just supplying silk. Because silk is a product you can live with or live without. But without metallurgy, you can't fight battles, you can't live, you need a basic vessels and all that. So, we were actually supplying the more essential products few millennia ago, which is why we were called Hend, Al Hend, the precious land, the precious one. So, that was a brand of Bharat in multiple ways. That's what we've seen. And here. which is why, actually, if you see this brand, People have come searching for us. So, while while we were called India, the lands around us that people came looking for ended up being called East Indies, West Indies. And when they, uh, you know, wrongly landed up in a land and thought it was India and the people there came to be called Red Indians, Indonesia again. So, all these names are names which have come because people associated all these again with india the search was for india all over the world because, Black bar, that was a search. because That's it is like you know in in uh, western uh, countries they have this notion they have this uh, idea of saying that at the end of the rainbow there's a pot of gold so india was literally the the pot of gold at the end of uh, the rainbow and uh, we've been a proud uh, showcase for uh, so many different brands iron and steel zinc cotton the color blue, sugars, ships. See, we not only used ships to trade and navigate, but uh, we actually sold, we made and sold ships also for the world. Even today, the dows of Arab, uh, Arabia are made in India. In the Malabar coast, if you go there, are, the dows are being made there. And uh, we have all of Vasco da Gama's records of uh, how the Indian ships were far, far superior. Of course, it's a different story what happened to the shipping industry during British times. That's yet another uh, story for another session. Uh, then you had spice. Normally, people talk that India means spice. This is one of the brands that people associate with. They don't see all these brands, heavy brands and the luxury brands as well, like diamonds, perfume. Today, if you look at it, Europe prides, France prides itself on perfume on culinary uh, uh, items uh, you have belgium saying that that's the place for diamonds but all of these have gone from india including all the softer knowledge so fundamentally if you see like we said the word bharat uh, means also people who relish knowledge we have been a brand for both hard substances as well as for softer knowledge and uh, we can keep talking endlessly about all these uh, products and the brand and uh, we'll be open for any questions that you have uh, at the moment. So, 
could you uh, elaborate a little more on the soft uh, knowledge part because we discussed about yeah. the science metallurgy and all that so what was the soft knowledge part also if you can See, as uh, we should uh, uh, thank you dr so as we should right from zero to infinity is all this is uh, what we discussed as soft knowledge uh, we, we have this so it is not just if you go to uh, uh, there is a book called Roots in India. Can you show the book first, please, if you don't mind? Then we'll explain to you where it will be. So we'll certainly take up certain aspects of this, uh, since you asked. If you just go to the Bharat Yarn website, and uh, if you go to the section on books, please, that's where it is. And if you scroll, the whole series is called Autobiography of India. See, the first volume is called Made in India. It's a hard product which you just bought. We spoke about, we just spoke of one and a half hard products and so on, the, so many of them. The other is called Roots in India, where the soft ones, if you see, which they are all roots here. And the fourth volume is about leads from India, where India has given the leads. So that's also uh, the, the two soft points. Having said this, we just take one example for you. Now, see, for example, if you look at, these are the main, many things we gave, like, for example, rhinoplasty, maths, various lifestyle issues, sports, the different issues. We just take one example since you said if you want maths, you want to take this more, more popular one. Obviously, it says Einstein says we gave zero or uh, anything to count. Uh, uh, that's what we say. So look at this word. A.L. Basham, an Australian. This is what he says in his book, The Wonder That Was India. He says the debt of the Western world to India in the field of mathematics cannot be overestimated because most of the discoveries and inventions of which Europe is so proud of would have been impossible without a developed system of mathematics in India. And this in turn would have been impossible if Europe had been shackled by the unwieldy system of Roman numerals. The unknown man who who discovered the new system was from the world's point of view after Buddha, the most important son of India. Buddha philosophically, yes, Shunivada, that's a different principles. But if you look at maths, of course, there's no one son of it. The whole body of scholars, scientists, rishis who have given us the field of Ganitam, mathematics, Gana. Gana for count. Gana for weighty also. So that is what you got. So look at this key point that this person A.L. Basham is making. Now all of you, just close your eyes for a moment and try to, all of you know the Roman numerals. 1, 2, 3, oh, 1 and then a V and a V and a V plus V and then 1 and V and 2 and then X and X, uh, X minus 1 for 10 and 10 is X and uh, 11 is X1, right? X2 is 12. Now try counting or multiplying with those Roman numerals. Try any math, simple mathematical formulation with your Roman numerals. Anything. Not possible. So none of your so-called scientific discoveries would have been possible using the Roman numerals of 1, V, X, X, I, I, X. Not possible, isn't it? So you needed a totally different system. And who gave that? And uh, the clue to this also lies in the fact that if you look at the Gregorian calendar, which we follow now, uh, which is uh, uh, the, you know, today we are in 2022 uh, AD, which is actually now being called CE, common era. People no longer say AD and BC. AD means Anno Domino and BC means before Christ. So that has been changed. The nomenclature is changed. And people say, instead of AD, they say CE, common era. And BC, they say BCE, meaning before common era. So the association with BC and AD is no longer there, but the numbers stay the same. So today we are in 2022, CE. And so you look at this Gregorian calendar system. You have minus one or one BCE. And after that, you have 1 CE. Is there a zero tier? You there is no zero tier. Because there is no zero. So they didn't give a place for zero tier. So you have minus 1 plus 1. You don't have anything in between. Because there is no such a number existed as recently as 400 years ago. 
Yes, we have this from time immemorial. So, get the idea there. So, when you say soft power, that's a huge soft power. I'll just show you an example because when you say, this was a chat I had with uh, Dr. Ratno uh, last evening. Today we say common era. That is in English. What do you call it in Indian languages? Let me share you something with you as a slide. So, you said BCA because that is related to Christ. So, the, the terminology is BC, BC, Anna Dobin actually said, that's what we use now. But if you look from Indian angle, in, in, in Hindi and all that, what do you call it now? Samanya Sambat, common era. Purva Samanya Sambat is there. And in Tamil, Canada, all languages you have. So, the terminology should be created by us. Not only in English to call it common era, but in all languages to call it Similarly, if See, you... it's very interesting. See, we don't have the need for all these kind of terminologies ever. Can you guess why? Can you guess why we didn't have to have terms like Samanya Samvat, Purva Samanya Samvat and all that? Because our calendar, it just says 5100 years from Kali Yuga. So, we just have Kali Yuga as our marker and we have been counting forward from Kali Yuga. We did not have a minus. So, we did not have one historical figure whose birth we said before him and after him. Now, because we are all following the Gregorian calendar, so we have to now invent terms like Purva Samanya Samvat, Samanya Samvat, if you are talking in uh, uh, local languages in Tamil or Kannada. But because we are following that system and we are now inventing our regional words for it. But our original calendrical system, if you see, it is based on Kali Yuga, our, our time, timekeeping. Today we say timekeeping is horology. So that means how to keep time. Horal, horology, it comes from hora, for time. And people say the hora because it's Greek and Greek gave the idea of timekeeping to the world. But the word horology, hora, comes from the Indian uh, traditional world, word ahoratra. So, see, a whole ratra, meaning continuous day and night, Same. cycle of day and night. And from that you get hora, from where you get horology. All these are, again, softer aspects uh, that we have given. And uh, So, the idea of timing, the idea of horology itself is brand part. Because it comes from, if you ask them, how did the word hora come or why hora, the Greeks don't have an answer. But we know it comes from Aho Ratra, meaning continuous cycle of day and night, unending cycle of day and night. So the, we took the, the jo co joined word, the central form, and made it Hora. The English word Abar also comes from it. When you ask for soft power, this is soft power. And if we do not know it, see, the important aspect of brand Bharat is idea is three things. One, we should know it. The problem is we don't know what are our brands. And once we know it, you have to then own it. And so first is know, then you own it. And how do you own it? Owning comes out of practice. Owning comes out of it being a part of your popular culture itself. It being spoken about, it being practiced. So then it becomes your culture and then you start claiming it. You start flaunting it. You start saying it's it's a brand. So it is a brand, but if you don't say steel is your brand, others will say, oh, steel is there in China, steel is there in America, steel is there in Japan. What is there? Not that. The very idea of steel, we have been giving the best steel for the world. So if you think of steel, you have to think with India in mind. If you think of zero, you think it's India in mind, Bharat in mind. So Unless you know it yourself, you will not own it. If you don't own it, you cannot claim it or flaunt it. So the first thing that comes is knowledge of what are all your products, what are all your strengths, what are all your capabilities, what all have your grandfather had, great-grandfather, great-grandmother had, your ancestors had, and what is its unique knowledge. That is what will give you the idea of brand Bharat to know it, to own it, and third is to express it, expound it, to flaunt it. 
unless you do this, you will not have the full range with you. That is important. So there is hard power, there is soft power. Actually, so it's a combination of both that creates the idea of brand Bharat or a period of time. All this is available in our website. And there's a series of short films, especially cotton. You see, we made, I think, about 30 short films on cotton. Please visit our uh, YouTube channel. Watch them. Because whatever we are trying to say, we already made them into short films for you to all repeatedly watch. For unfortunately, some bandwidth reason, you're, you're not able to get the audio also along Google with it. Google Meet can't uh, share so, so, from your laptop. So that's the problem. Google Meet, you're not able to share from your laptop the audio. There, there's an issue. That's all. It's, it's, it's due to the... Uh, this particular purpose, otherwise it's there because you know. So this is the idea that you have the uh, idea of brand Bharat, which encompasses both realms, the hard power and soft power. So do visit our site and take all the data. We'll obviously be available, glad to interact with you. And if some of you are really interested in a lot more of this detailed information, what we'd suggest is we conduct these as formal courses for what we call Hindu University America. This we do every Saturday evenings at 8 30 pm. We should just show you the slide. Just show it, please. So that those who want, you're welcome. There we'll take up and analyze each one of these aspects in good depth, in detailed form. Okay. So if you come to the Bharatyan website, just show you the share the screen for you. See, this is a course we can call Exploring Hinduism. This is starting this quarter, October 8th. It's at 8 30 pm. India. Actually, it's a entire uh, series on the Hindu civilization itself. You conduct a certificate course on Hindu civilization study, where uh, we look at uh, both the hard and the soft. So we look at our ideas, our thought, our thinking, as well as the contributions we have made to the world in both realm of matter, the hard, and in the realm of mind. So the sciences, arts, living, lifestyle, as well as the big five and how they have been game changers for the world and so on. So uh, that is there. And anybody interested, you can check out our website or even uh, write to us and we'll be happy to give you more information. So these are formal courses we conduct through the year. So those who are interested, welcome. So that we can discuss in detail in a structured manner. See, webinars are one <laughs> Just to kindle interest, but you can go into layer by layer and then get into understanding because that's then it because brand bar is such a serious stuff. Because to know you must know you need to go into detail. Otherwise, if you go out and talk to somebody, it's ah, not short true. Unless you know the facts and the layers, you'll not be able to discuss it elsewhere. It's a step by step process. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh Riki Hariji and uh Emaji. Uh it's it's always uh a very difficult task to, you can say, um, take a bucket out of vast ocean. So that considering the huge amount of uh, knowledge you have shared, whatever you have gained must be many times more than that. But whatever you have shared on your website, through your books, through your programs, through your courses, that itself is, is humongous. And considering the uh, very limited time which we have, that is almost, you can say, one uh, university class. So uh, what you have uh, compiled is, is like uh, almost a five-year course in a university. So uh, still we, we are uh, extremely, uh, uh, you can say, lucky to have you here and to listen to very insightful points you have raised. There are a couple of questions, uh, uh, points being raised. So I would uh, request uh, one by one, if anybody wants to ask a question, you can put it in the chat and you can raise your hand so that I can ask you to unmute yourself and uh, then uh, ask the question to our speakers today. Uh, there are uh, questions. If anybody wants to ask uh, Amit Gupta ji, you have raised a question. You want to ask that question? Okay. Uh, I, I'll read out the question. Uh, the question is, uh, respected uh, sir, to my understanding, we had gold reserve because of international trade, including uh, spices, silk and cotton, minerals, and above all, technology that is manufacturing. So uh, he's raising the question: Was it only or majorly for the steel? Please elaborate. See, we said obviously all products, cotton brought in a lot of gold, spices also brought in a lot of gold. Each one brought in. 
But what we wanted to highlight is nobody talks about steel bringing in coal and nobody talks about gold follows steel. See, everybody thinks wherever steel, wherever gold is, gold is a precious thing and we go towards it. But what we are trying to bring in a mindset point in you that where there is good quality steel, gold will follow it. That's what we try to highlight. We are not saying that cotton didn't bring in gold. We are not saying that other products didn't bring in gold. We are not saying that at all. That also happened. But <laughs> okay, the point is like this. See, if you look at it by quantity, volume of trade, trade of steel is it far outweighs literally uh, and metaphorically the volume of and the value of trade of cotton or dye or any other substance. So because uh, steel as such is far more valuable in the world it was then and even today and the volumes that you have to trade in are also quite huge so that way the amount of uh, uh, revenues that the go i mean trade of steel can bring in is really very high and uh, that has held good in the past we are seeing how it has changed for other countries in the world as well and it is high time we recognize that we uh, do less of ore export but really do make the steel in India and start exporting steel and steel products to make sure that we can bring back a lot more of this value added revenue back into our uh, land. That's the idea we also bring out. See today we are exporting actually a lot of ore. We are not doing giving the value addition which we were doing earlier. The value addition that we were giving the technique of uh, steel making that we had then has they have not reached that quality of steel even today today also in the metallurgical world they are very very clear that they have not been able to make that quality of steel and also if you look at it we had sustained production for so many millennia that means the way in which we were making which was a very decentralized way of not exploiting uh, you know any one place too much so that kind of technique has also been quite effective and we have still achieved industrial uh, uh, volumes of trade, production and all that. So it is something that we really, I mean, and especially as India Policy Foundation, uh, you know, from a strategy point of view, we really have to sit and think back. Are we doing the right thing by, you know, just going and digging and exploiting in one or two locations and then taking out so much ore and you know, fundamentally, it's very, if you think, just go up on a higher plane and start thinking. In India, you're creating holes, deep holes of this mines. And somewhere else, you're using that steel to make tall skyscrapers of steel. So you're creating a kind of a lopsided uh, thing uh, compared to where instead of uh, the decentralized kind of techniques that we had followed. Uh, very sustainable ways of manufacture earlier. So, what is it that we can do for a via media in the present age? Is something that food for thought. Uh, that's that's very interesting because we all know how uh, Goa was ruined due to export of iron ore uh, <laughs> to to particularly China and in the last couple of decades. And uh, I, after Japan, if I remember, uh, Korea also. Uh, made a mark in terms of steel production. Some of the big steel companies are Korean. Yes. And they, they wanted to establish a plant in, in Odisha and that was opposed uh, by many of us were also there considering it was a foreign company, multinational company. But now we are realizing that whatever you have mentioned that uh, it's, it's, it's not wise to export your uh, raw material. It's always better to produce uh, goods and particularly in terms of good quality steel. And I also remember uh, once interacting with uh, uh, some tribals in, in Harkan where they were uh, complaining about that uh, they were, their ancestors have been, you can say, making very good quality uh, these uh, equipments for construction and for agriculture. But now big companies, I don't want to name big corporates, very big uh, reputed corporates in India who started making those uh, equipments and ruined the livelihoods of millions of people. 
and they were saying at least you, you you should have kept this to us why why a favda is being made by a, a you can say company with a 10000 crore of turnover 50000 crore of turnover at least allow us to make the favda that uh, thing which is which is used by the farmers and the uh, laborers so uh, these are issues anyway uh, taking it forward uh, gopal you have raised a point about the time you mentioned about patanjali gopal ji ha sir just an addition i was carried away and i mujhe bada acha laga sunke jo shabd ye ahar shabd hai ye bada meaningful hai jaise hum purvan madhyan aur panini ki ashtadhyayi pe कार्तिक के रिस्पॉन्स कात्यायन के रिस्पॉन्स में कात्यायन के वार्तिक के रिस्पॉन्स में पतंजलि जी ने महाभाष्य लिखा मीन्स अ बिग कमेंट्री तो ही हैज डिवाइडेड ऑल द चैप्टर्स फ्रॉम मॉर्निंग टू इवनिंग द एंटायर डे डे मीन्स आहन सो आहानी का स्त्रीलिंग में उसको आहानी का बताया एटी फोर आहनिकाएं उन्होंने लिखी है तो आई वो जस्ट एडिंग इट सो इट्स इंटरेस्टिंग ऑल दी वर्ड्स इन्वेंटेड बर्थडे a few months ago received you the entire set of books i think it's very important that the work that you are doing is very important for this to reach the younger children because you know uh, i think your work brings pride in uh, we as indians india as a nation and we as citizens so i think you are doing extremely wonderful work so thank you so much for it i think this is great service to the nation and uh, i i just wanted your comments on two important aspects i teach at uh, jnu a place which uh, has both uh, gangs you know uh, i i must say the nationalist and the anti national so this is a place this is a home. yes this is a place where a lot of debates happen one of the things uh, that is most often said about india and indic perspective when we are talking is that uh, we haven't taken ownership in terms of like we probably have a lot of knowledge but we never took ownership of it basically i think this is from our idea of being knowledge seekers as well as knowledge givers we think knowledge to be a free flowing thing unfortunately in a knowledge economy this is very important so i want to ask you the role of patents and copyrights when it comes to this entire when it comes to protecting brand bharat how do you have any idea about it or have you thought about it second you know in international relations there's a very important concept and kuldeep ji uh, mentioned about it mentioned about it the soft power concept the soft power concept yes and most of the time we again bring it to american thinkers and american scholars jo- joseph nye is supposed to be the propagator of it and we have a lot of there is something called a soft power index and that index does not have a lot of intangible aspects when it comes to calculating soft power of a nation and that's why we always see india lagging far behind when it comes to soft power in an era where soft power cultural diplomacy is very important how uh, or what is it that you suggest for scholars like us working in uh, or trying to establish an indian perspective in international relations that's my area of specialization so how do you what is your suggestion to go about it because more often than not uh you know because probably we have a a huge history and we have oral history and that is not recognized by the world most of the time they talk of referencing and again in referencing the western world seems to have a very strong backup in that sense so i would like your views on these two points thank you so much aishi ji uh for the kind words you started your discussion and also our appreciation and best wishes to your son in his glorious career ahead one and uh, i'll take one point or one point to say this go step by step uh, see when you said india had only oral tradition we are in there is a chapter in our book called breaking the myths to say how oral tradition is limited only to the veda all both our itihasa all our purana shastras all of them are written tradition you could also memorize it 
doesn't mean they were all oral, no. Only Veda by design were oral. All, that's it. if you see, we have, in our book, we have said there are 22 traditions of history keeping. It's there, you can see it in the book. Uh, so, all of them were written down tradition. All Katha, all Katha, so all of them. So, so to say that we have a clear written tradition going back millennia and we have volumes and volumes of data of manuscripts in the traditional format. And we even did a small uh, research on this about 10 years ago. Of all the manuscripts that we have, we say we don't have, actually we have a lot of manuscripts. Less than 8% have been touched by this generation and even translated. The balance, 90 plus percent have not even been moved around by us. So we are losing 90% of return manuscripts in our lifetimes, in our generation period itself. So to say that we don't have written is again something somebody else told us about it. But reality is we have humongous amount of manual written manuscripts across this land, which is what we have. That's one side of the point. Interestingly, we say soft power. Obviously, the indices, the, uh, the matrix have all been fixed by the West. That's the reality. Now, as part of the soft power, we must change and include our points in the larger matrix. For example, if you see our foreign ministry, so why should I link it to your access? We have, see, it's becoming a multipolar world. It's no more the access points. So, we have to realize it's being a multipolar world. And as you said, three points. One, we should know what is it we have. Very important. And then own it. And third is to flaunt it. All the three we are not doing. And a good forum to do this is an institution like India Policy Foundation, wherein we know what are our strengths. And then you should make efforts to own each of them. Because if we don't own it, for example, I'll tell you, there was a function in uh, Delhi last week where we met uh, Dr. Kuldeep Patnoji. In that, we spoke in a later session. In, in an earlier session, a speaker from Belgium came and spoke Antwerp. And she said, Belgium owns the idea of diamonds. Antwerp, the town of Antwerp. The industry of diamond. Diamond is owned by them. That is from 1700s onwards, mid 1750s. That is only for 250 years they own diamond. They did not know about diamond before that. Diamonds have been owned by us for the last 4,000, 5,000 years and more. So if we don't say diamond is an Indian product, it's an Indian idea. So it is our error actually to, we have to now stand up. Forget what happened in the last 40, 50, 60, 70 years. No use crying over spilt milk. Let us now say, put our hand up and say, diamond is our product. We have, you did not know about diamond before we gave it to you. If we don't say it, it's our error. So if there is a soft power matrix, we must start owning what are our soft powers. Only then we can include it in the extended matrix. Only because you cannot go play in their matrix. First, we have to know what are our strengths, list them out, enlist them out, own them, then expand the matrix. When you start expanding the matrix, your soft power keeps going up and other soft power keeps coming down to the level where it should be. So naturally, this whole so matrix, the form of the matrix starts changing. If you don't do that, you don't go play their game by their rules, then you're not going to go far. That is important to know. So it's a larger power. Yes, they have formed a matrix, but it start expanding it, bringing in our points. So that is essentially, that's what we said more than once. Let us know what are our strengths. Innately, for example, I'll tell you one point. In the world has gone through different eras. In our book, Future from India, Brand volume, volume 5, we have written about it. There's a one section only called Future from India. I'm sure you must have that book. That's what you said. If you look at that, the world goes to different eras. 
from 1600s, Saudi Arabia, we went to transportation era. Then we get we got into communication era. Then we got to different eras, right? Then we went into telecommunication era, 1900s onwards. Then we went into internet era and all those eras we went into now. So what is the era you're getting into in the region of 2010, 2020? Knowledge era. What is the next era you're going to get into in 2025, 2030? 20, AI era. Once AI comes in, because you're a professor of JNU, I'm saying this to you now. Once AI comes in, rules for about 10, 15 years. So once AI comes in, then humans and machines are going to be almost similar. Machines will have far greater power than humans. Then how do you differentiate humans? Or what is your differentiating factor of humans? Once AI is coming for two, three decades, what is it? Then your mind. Your mind, because machines, AI cannot have mind. At least the way we see in the next four or five decades. That's our uniqueness is our mind. Chinta, isn't our mind, isn't it? So, what will come in 20, 30, 20 cognition years? So, what will happen is your mind era will set in. When mind era sets in, which civilization has researched maximum on mind for the last 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 years? Our civilization. So, if we don't put up our hands today and say, when the mind era comes in the world, come to us, we are ready with that knowledge. Then you are a Vishwa Guru. You are not going to be Vishwa Guru by following them and doing the AI. Because AI, 120 more countries are going to be leading in AI. China, Israel, some countries of Europe, US, Japan. Many of the countries are going to be leading in AI along with India. So you are not alone. But when it comes to after that era that comes, that is your advanced planning. This is where centers like India Policy Foundation come into play. When mind era kicks in by 2050, and we should tell you, you are going to get into mind era, then look at us. We have the points for the world. Then we are a Vishu Guru. But for that, we must get our act together. Know what all we have in the mind era. It could be in Sanskrit, it could be in Kannada, it could be in Assamese, it could be in any language. Get them all together. The products of mind era in multiple languages. No need after translating them in English alone. But know what all we have in the era of mind. Because if you have to read in if you have to read a text in Assamese, learn Assamese and read it there. Because only then you get the full juice of the text. The Saransha you get only there. By translating English, you won't get the full Saransha. So, but are we ready even to acknowledge and say that we are there? Goshna of Vishnu Guru is different. That's just Goshna. But are, do you have the facts to say, to claim that space? Our ancestors claimed zero. They had it, they gave it. Then we have to claim the space and see they're going to be available for the mind era. So then is when the world from 2050 to 2100 will really be the leader. Not just in population, not just in economics, but also in leading the next era of the world. That is where institutions like India Policy Foundation should be a huge step forward. And we at Bharatya will be glad to help in this direction. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Ayushi, for asking this very pertinent question and appreciate it. I think there is Piyush Ji also who wants to, who has raised his hand. I hope I answered your question and a little more, Ayush, Professor Ayush. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Piyush Ji, you want to say something? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Actually, I am professor in JNU itself and I am working, my specialization is in artificial intelligence. And we, oh, okay. when we teach our students and more precisely natural language processing, I am working in different languages. Uh, when we teach our students, we, we ha have many references about NLP coming from context-free grammar before, during test or before, uh, you can say, we can we can prove that all the context free grammar is ours. 
हमने शुरू किया इवन द सीमेंटिक नेटवर्क वी हैव मेनी टैक्स Now, where we can say that semantic network is also ours, but when the words come artificial intelligence, uh, I I couldn't find any reference before 1950 that this word or kritrim buddhi that whether any one of our uh, gurus or rishis have worked on uh, even theoretical aspect of artificial intelligence. So, can you give uh, me um, or you know any reference about that? See, I you know what I would uh, put it like this. <clears throat> I don't think we should be looking for one-on-one -on -one match between then to now, especially on finer aspects of technology. Uh, I think fundamentally, if we can see that we have we have led and there is enough to explain the idea from the past, I think we should use that as our ground rule and our direction because too many things i mean it's so much in the past and this is today where we are there is a lot of difference so exact one on one match we may not find but there there could be some similarities uh, because you're talking about nlp and semantics uh, you will find that uh, across many indian languages you will find that semantically there are certain common words itself and which has kept the civilization bound so which means that even thinking wise we have all thought similar and again going back if you look at it the semantics part of it you will find that when you say it is contextual you will find that in most of our languages the word the the word as such denotes the function the character the trait so there itself you will find intelligence the word itself has the intelligence as to what it is representing you don't have to look up yet another separate dictionary today if i say the word uh, geography uh, you know in english and for all of us we have to then look up what is the meaning of the word geography whereas if you take our own i'm just taking a very very simple lame uh example uh but if you say in indian languages you will say bhu gola or bhu garbha shastra for geology for geology all of which automatically give you the meaning the context and uh, so many other words if you actually go into the root etymol etymology of each of those words you will find that there is the context and the intelligence also built into that into the word itself so how people have used it leveraged it could be different for the needs then and what we are doing it for the needs and, and mind you today we are relying on ai and all that because we are trying to bring in a lot of uh, machine intelligence and uh, that was perhaps not the need then and why it was not the need then is something worth thinking and worth pondering so if we didn't have the need then how did we meet it and which is a better so those are all a different aspect of uh, a totally different layer so the needs then and now are very different so i don't know that you will find exact artificial intelligence uh, equivalent uh, in our text a uh, processing on this point see she used something no uh, see every word had a context in which the word was framed for us that gave you the whole layer of meaning with every word you take for example it's evening night to you look at the word nakshatra You just think nakshatra means star. No, they are all naksha in the sky. In the sky, because they are mapping the sky for us. They are all naksha actually. That which bear the uh, ability to be a map in the sky. That is what the stars are because they help navigation. Today we are grown in a mindset where we think if we have to travel, the best time to travel is daytime. In the in the seas, but if you talk, if you ask a good sailor, they will say, "Oh, if you want to sail, the best time to sail is night, because that is when in the open sea where there is nothing else to uh, guide you, you have the skies and the stars to actually give you the direction. sense of direction." So the the whole uh, mindset, the thinking itself, can be very different from then to now. So even in AI, so unless we use this, not just the grammar of the sentence, what you said, what you just now said, 
but even each usage, prayoga of every shabda has a meaning. So that is what the speciality is of the in across language, which is why while I'm going to use a German word, but it's got a lot of Indian connotation. Sprachbu. It means a library of different languages. It's a German term. I'm sure you must Union be Union of languages. Union of languages. It's used a lot in Europe for the European languages. Whereas the Samparka Basha of Bharat, meaning from Karoshti, Pashtun, to all the up to the uh, Northwest Burmese languages, to the Northeast languages, to the Tamil language and, and Sinhala, if you look at it, there is a union. So that whole, and all of them are intertwined languages. The words, if you see, of course, how you use the grammar today, how you pronounce it all starts varying across centuries. But there's a base for it. That's why people could travel anywhere. And they were all connected with activities of the civilization. Not all kinds of words, but fundamentally that which were interconnected activities, they had common words. So uh, that way you will find that etymology, syntax, all of these and the word, the way the words were designed, they had the context, they had the meaning. And interestingly, all of this, you know, if you trace, if you go back and back, it comes from the innate Indian thought that the gross world comes from subtle. So it is the sukshma which creates the sula. Right from the Sankhya thought, it comes, the idea comes that the sukshma guna creates everything else. So the whole physical world gets created from the subtle aspects. And that is why even the words. They have the meaning coming from their function, the quality and the traits. So you have to really, if you want to understand the Indian civilization, you have to really go back to its thought, the roots. It yes. has to be something that comes as the ethos of the entire civilization. So you should link it to Sukhsu because the Western thought doesn't go beyond the Stula. Unless you go into Sukhsma, that's a glass ceiling. And only the Indians can fathom across the glass ceiling. There's a glass wall. And that itself is a beautiful soft power. And the soft power is hidden in our language. It is hidden in our tradition, our practices, our thought, yeah, thinking. Everything it is hidden. It is for us to be able to now slowly pull it out and harness and show it to the rest of the world. I'll take it to you, Dr. Pratap Singh. I'll test an example. A historian, what can he do? He can go from 100 BC to 100 CE to 500 CE, uh, CE to 2000 BC to, to 2000 CE. He can travel across time in a, in a dialogue, isn't it? That is a chemistry person or physics person will not do that. It's only historian who is able to travel horizontally across times, across centuries in a, in a, in a dialogue. Because that's his thought process straight to it. Similarly, in soft power, using especially for AI, using the strength of our language, we are the ones who can travel, we meaning the Bharatiya with the mind, can travel from realms, realms both to Sukshma to Stula and back to Stula. You can't expect a Western trained mind to go into Sukshma and come back into Stula. Because huge training by itself and you do it naturally. And you open up windows. The moment you go into Sukshma and come back, you see how many more windows you open up. I'm sure you will use this a lot, uh, Dr. Singh. I hope you answered some of your points. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Actually, sir, uh, basically, that uh, when we teach artificial intelligence, I, I, I'm now coming precisely to the point. When we go back to, for, say, information science, information engineering, then we more go back to the logics, then we go back to the epistemology and ontology, and then we have some studies which are uh, of uh, Pluto and Aristotle. There we find that, that they both were searching for intelligence beside human brain. 
that is our point that they both have searched for intelligence intelligence beside human brain uh, for example universe is also intelligent body a trees can be uh, intelligent nature can be intelligent so my question was that if uh, any other of our uh, scholar have done same study that, uh, that we find intelligent have well they have delved into all just this precise intelligence beyond the human brain and that is what you find in all the six darshana right from nyaya vaiseshika to sankhya each one of them they use different 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 methods to show you that there is that extra consciousness that extra thing which they are not naming and they are still searching we have addressed this beautifully as consciousness uh, in the entire universe they mean the best has not yet named it nor have they don't know see they are still and searching the woods we have gone there walked that path and named it and given it very clear detailings that's what she's trying to explain to you so what we have done is we have had six thought schools of thought philosophies if you will as nyaya where that is the subtlest and just pure logic you establish this existence of this consciousness and then you come down to the vedanta and then followed by gita also where you still point and talk about this external i mean i don't want to say external right i want to talk about the overall consciousness in this entire universe so we have recognized this consciousness and uh, that is what our entire system of philosophy has been about and we have given it different name we have called it purusha we have called it brahma uh, brahman we have called it by different different names in different systems of philosophy so we have given it a good place and that is what we have to now get back to and show that there is something more beyond thank you professor okay okay sir. okay okay sir thank you sir uh thank you, sir. Uh, do you want to ask something uh, yes sir thank you for the very informative session sir and ma'am you spoke about steel silk etc as you rightly said the technical know how of how many of these are made is lost is there enough research being done in india to revive such lost knowledge lost knowledge for example, for example bangladesh has been trying to revive dhaka machine for long now do we have such efforts happening in india yeah, there's a different you see yeah, it's not only dhaka muslim there are different types of products we're trying to revive all over because unfortunately in the last 200 years of colonial rule and before that uh, the oppression many of the good quality produce at the world looks for the native produce of we have lost not only the fraction wood steel itself what we show the traditional we are making zinc or all, all that have been lost so the many things that have been slowly revived that's a good part of it. at least is an effort now to revive which was not there a few decades ago across products are there for example when you say dhaka muslin in coastal andhra pradesh there is a place called machili patna okay i'm sure you some of you may have heard of it etc so they had a muslin <coughs> so different they are similarly in, uh, in fact the, the word machili patnam comes from masuli patnam they were exporting all this muslin from that coromandel coast i mean in andhra uh, coast so they, if, you, if you go to our films and look at cotton is one film four minute film on masuli patnam okay please watch the film later similarly if you go to kerala there is a river called chaliya river chaliya so from which you get the english word shawl from which you get the word sari so there again they have to revive it so there are multiple efforts now to revive so it's not exactly the same so it's not only taka must because we have been told only i said that's a final biggest muslin it's good no doubt about it that equally good muslins in other part of the world other part of india all of them have to be cumulatively revived each of an independent distinct character because somebody in the british india wrote the taka muslin the best is for him taka muslin is good no doubt there are equally other good muslims too all of them have to be cumulatively revived that should be the effort and it's so that should be effort of not the government and all the bodies that sir because it's it has to be a multi pronged effort uh, uh, sometime dr piyush pratap singh professor we could discuss this point further about a and how we can and 
the next steps because yeah. that's a very deep subject. What? Uh, yes, sir. Actually, I'm working on it uh, from quite a some time now. So I need more and more uh, say proof to show my point. What you are saying, I already yeah, said to my student, but we we need some supporting text also for that. Yeah, we can always discuss offline too, and take it forward uh, slowly because it's it's a long it's, it's a long walk. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, not very tangible, also very abstract. So we will be cautious also what we say and how we go about it. Very cautious. Uh, sir, I have the last question. Uh, since we talked about uh, steel and zinc, uh, I was wondering at what stage of time we lost respect for the people who were in, who were in these activities, these activities, like very skillful activities. Uh, whether they were iron smiths, whether they were uh, weavers, and we started treating them as inferior. Was it external influence? Uh, was it a loss of uh, repute uh, or loss of uh, relevance in the changing economic or changing political situation? Because unless we recognize and we give, you can say, uh, respect to that particular class which has skills. Uh, I don't think we we can again go back to that stage. So, what do you uh, want to say? About it? See, obviously, the uh, few hundred years of onslaught followed by the colonial uh, oppression obliterated many of this. It's obvious. So, that's, but the point is, still there are many. Available was still doing it all in their own ways. So they all need sucker to ensure that they pass on to the next generation. Otherwise, the next generation is not going to be interested in taking it forward. That is obvious again. So that uh, I think much needs to be said there. The third point was what is of interest is the world is coming around to a view now that all these mega plants of any product, not just steel, but any product alone is not enough. You need so the idea of uh, what Eric Schumacher said in the 1970s and 80s of small is beautiful. He, while he made a statement and a book probably 40 years back, 50 years back, it is substantially coming true on many fields that you need a range of products. You don't need only the products of the mega mills, but you also need this. And this is place for them. We are, I'm not denouncing the, the mega mills. You need them for a certain world. You need these also. You need mass producing hotels and need people which are very niche hotels for niche foods. So you need both. Similarly, you need both products. And this is market for both products now. Your mass production steel, your specific products of steel, your mass production of zinc, your specific needs, cotton, everything. So and, and all these people today the world is getting connected much better to online. So Encouraging them to be there on the platform is a big help. Skills they would have, but the encouragement and recognition and giving them that little bit of assistance, both finance and all other forms of assistance, I think we'll get them back onto the main stage platform and they'll have their own place. Let them not be, look at the huge production units of some other things and be just amazed by it and keep quiet. No. There's a place for both. This just which is which I would not have made the statement with this confidence probably 20, 30 years ago. There is space now for this and that and that. That is all the it's so the flattening of the world is happening in a way where all this space, all that they need to be that little bit recognition, little bit support. In different forms of support and placing them on the platform is what is needed. Then there are a whole host of people who will again come back onto the big stage and they'll climb back. They have the intelligence, capability, and the gumption, the guts to climb back and make their product felt the world over. Because people genuinely want different products now. So we'll have to look at that. Because they don't want the only the machine manufactured ones anymore. That was there in the 1970s and 80s. We have to give them the space, like like Ataka Muslim, like one from Bachuli Patna or a hundred other places in India. Equally great products. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, 
was great uh, listening to you and uh, knowing more about what great work you have been doing uh, such a huge canvas you have uh, you can say put uh, before yourself and uh, now uh, trying to you can say uh, find out the jewels from the vast indian knowledge traditions uh, for the benefit of our coming generations and uh, what uh, ayushi ji also ayushi ji also the younger the younger generation is also taking interest in these subjects to know more about it and uh, that is something i think uh, more than such webinars with uh, people like us it, it's a matter of success and matter of satisfaction for you but uh, you spared time for us and uh, talked on diverse issues and answered patiently all the queries so on behalf of india policy foundation bharat niti mitra i am i'm extremely grateful to you i i thank our uh, speaker hari ji and you know hari ji and uh, i also thank all the participants thank you very much for giving us time giving us opportunity for such a wonderful discussion such an enlightening talk and i am i'm uh, looking forward to more such interactions and uh, more fruitful uh, and productive uh, uh, association with uh, bharat gyan and i am i am i would request each one of you to explore more about uh, the work great work uh, uh, mr and mrs hari are doing through the bharat gyan website and uh, as they recommended by watching the videos also and also particularly showing it to the uh, students younger generation recommending the work they have been doing mm -hmm.